The first thing she said to me, she goes, your baby's very, very sick. They gave us basically three options of what we could do with him. Um, we could take him home and let him pass. Um, we could do, um, go to a heart transplant list. Or we could do three surgeries um, within the first like four years of life. You hear of it happening to other, other parents and families, but when it actually happens to you, it's, it's like, it's, it's unreal, you know, and you, you just can't believe it. With Natalie Baker and Joe Tilly sharing with CBS News their personal experience as parents of a three-year-old living with a congenital heart defect. As we welcome you back to America's Forum, we note that every year approximately 40,000 babies are born with congenital heart defects. It is the leading cause of death among infants. It's a condition not many parents are aware of. Several groups are working to change that as this week, quite fittingly with Valentine's Day tomorrow, is Congenital Heart Defect Awareness Week. For more on this story, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Michael Black. He is the Medical Director for Pediatric Cardiology at the Palm Beach Children's Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital Center, or a Medical Center, I should say. Also joining us from our Newsmax TV newsroom, Newsmax Deputy Health Editor Nick Tate, who is the co-author of the Da Vinci Baby Boomer Survival Guide. Michael. Yes, this, this, this notion of congenital heart conditions affecting, what, one in 100 kids? A lot of those things are not diagnosed to adulthood. Uh, why do so many cases go undiagnosed? If it's not life-threatening when the baby is born or not picked up when a mother is pregnant, sometimes it's just a very slow, insidious set of symptoms, it's like having arthritis. So some adults go for 30, 40 years before they notice they're just really tired all the time and they have a problem. Most significant disease is picked up usually right away, either in utero or when a baby is born. Uh, early on, and this question has uh, concerned me through the years, the treatment, open heart surgery for infants, uh, there was a school of thought a while back that they didn't need anesthesia because the nerves were not fully developed. Has the thinking changed on that? Thank goodness, yes. For the majority of people, still in neonatal intensive care units, it's not uncommon to have the baby have a breathing put, tube put down when they're awake. But for heart surgery, we give uh, anesthetic, high-dose uh, narcotics, and the baby is asleep for hours. Uh, it seems much more humane, and I have three children. I would rather have that, too. Uh, doctor, it, it seems that when cases are obvious in children, they do get the attention, they do get the treatment they need, but you can survive into young, young adulthood without uh, knowing that you have this condition. What are some of the signs and the symptoms we should look for uh, in terms of whether you may be at risk? You mentioned feeling fatigue. What other kinds of things are a flag that you should be paying attention to? Um, excellent question. It depends on where the disease emanates from. Uh, we break the heart into usually a right and left side. Right side are blue blood, left side is bright red blood. One part goes to your lung, one part goes to your body. So if you have heart failure or part of the heart not working right, that's um, on the right side, you can have swollen ankles, you could have exercise fatigue, you could just be tired all the time. If it's a left side, typically you can have blood pressure issues, you could have palpitations where you have extra heartbeats, um, uh, headaches, um, a lot of things that are generally found in the community and in children and adults, but progressively, just persistent problems that always uh, seem to come up. So the thing is for those of us as we are growing older, pay attention to our bodies. You talked about feet swelling, fatigue, a variety of things because it could be a heart condition that, that you were born with. Absolutely. Uh, color changes are easy to see. But have, being tired every day, everyone works hard. You come home, you just think it's part of everyday routine. But if it persists and you are always the best judge of your body, you know when something's right and wrong, don't, don't ignore it. You know, listen to what your body's telling you. And if you have any doubt whatsoever, go see a physician. Uh, let's switch gears now to a new report from the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. They're claiming that foods high in cholesterol may not be bad for you after all. Let's listen to what Nina Teicholz, author of The Big Fat Surprise, had to say. And then, Michael, I'd like to get your reaction after we listen to this. Thank you. The reality is now that even the top government expert says we no longer recommend a low-fat diet. 
It's just that that word has not gotten out to the public yet. Because it's been 35 years of believing one thing. It's very hard to reverse out of that. It's hard for experts, it's hard for the government, and people are confused. There's all these flip-flopping headlines. We still equate fat with fat. Right. We think the fat in that pan is going to become the fat on me. And that turns out just not to be true. So, uh, again, an area where medical science and thinking has changed, fat can be good? Yes. So we know there's different types of cholesterols. There's low, medium, and kind of high density fats. For years, people say don't eat eggs. Eggs have a very good cholesterol in them. And in fact, what is an egg? It's a chicken. And no one says don't eat chicken. So eggs are very good. How much? Everything in moderation. But the real bad fats come from sugar. Sugar is our real enemy. So every time you have processed food, um, a donut, a piece of cake, that sugar goes into your liver and it converts it into a bad fat. So we're inundated with processed foods and very high sugar content. And if we can try to avoid those in moderation and stick to better fats, um, pro uh, cheese, some cheese are very good for you. Um, it probably would be cardioprotective. Doctor, those of us who follow these nutritional guidelines and health uh, uh, reports and, and the science know that what's really happening here in some ways is that the government is kind of catching up with what nutritionists and nutritional scientists have been saying for a long time, that it's really not fat and cholesterol that's the problem, it's really high sugar, high carbs, processed foods. But do you worry that this shift and this change will lead many people to say, you know what, who should we believe anymore? One day eggs are good, one day eggs are bad. One day wine is good, one day wine is bad. How, how, do, you, how do you think people should put this in perspective in light of the fact that these guidelines are changing and some people may say, well, why should we believe what they have to tell us today? About a minute to answer this, Michael. Okay, well, first of all, an excellent question. I think anytime something is abrupt, in its methods, you go from black to white, it's very hard for people to have some um, uh, conception that it makes a lot of sense. So everything should be shifted a little bit slower. So I think the reports are coming out, I think it's very good. The government doesn't want to supersede or interact acutely. But I believe that people are smart enough to understand that we don't know everything. And I'll give you an example. The mummies had atherosclerosis. There's some beliefs that an infection causes a heart disease, maybe chlamydia. There was a lot of reports that injury to the artery over time, then supplemented by different environmental factors and genetic factors, causes injury. So maybe actually that we don't really understand everything, which I really believe is true. Which is why we're going to have to have you back, Dr. I Michael Black. I only hope Black. so. It's great to have you today. Thanks, Keep an eye on the science, and thanks for the good work you do in children's cardiology. Dr. Michael Thank Black, you. thanks to you. Also, to our good friend Nick Tate in the Newsmax TV newsroom. And, of course, Nick has that great new book out, Da Vinci's Baby Boomer Survival Guide. You can get your copy by going to the website babyboomers711.com. We'll step aside for a Newsmax Now update.